what often happens is we see a person for a certain angle, for a certain facet, or for a certain lens, and then we generalize about it. The way I'd look at it is from three angles. One is the nature of work is changing, the workplace is changing, and the workforce. Manish, welcome back. <laughs> Thank you, Joanne. It's a pleasure to be here. <laughs> it's, a, it's a real pleasure to, to have you. I think we, we had such an inf insightful conversation last time and I, I really wanted to continue our chat and, and approach it from a different angle as well. So one of the things I was thinking about this morning is that I've been, as you probably know, I watch a lot of podcasts and lately I've been quite fascinated with high performance in a positive way and not in a, in a stressful way and thinking about ways in which we can maximize our, our potential. And I think one of the aspects I thought of, and we've discussed that previously when we've met, is profiling personality types. And may sometimes come as a surprise, you might not like what, what you get, but I think it's a, it's a really useful tool into an insight into who you really are. I think a lot of people may not fully know who, who they are, and it's not, I'm, I'm sure it's not the holy grail, but it, it's a good starting point. So can you talk to us a little bit about, I think the, the profile type that we spoke about was the Enneagram profile type. I'm sure there are others, but could you talk to us a little bit about this one and why do you think it would be useful for anyone, regardless of their professional careers, to, to try it? Okay. Well, thank you for that. I think what to, to, to give a perspective to it about personality profiling, this is something which has been, which has existed in a scientific way since I would say around just before the Second World War with Carl Jung. And then from there, um, they started to research more about human behavior. And one of the most groundbreaking personality profiling tools which came up was the MBTI, Myers-Briggs Types Indicator. And from there, the research continued and they started to go towards new tools like Facet 5, the Big Five Theory, SHL came up with their own. So you have quite a few uh, providers now on the market backed by research. Mm -hmm. And if you look at the Enneagram, it's possibly one of the most ancient ones around. Oh, wow. It okay. dates back to the ancient Sufis. I that time, that. they started okay. to study human behavior. And what they came up with was the first rea realization that what differentiates people is what drives us, our three centers of intelligence. Mm -hmm. So we have three centers of intelligence, the head, the heart, and the guts, right? So the Enneagram, as the word suggests, so it has nine core types mm -hmm. and three types driven by the head, by the mind, free from the heart, free from the guts. And you have, based on that, three core emotions associated with each center. So with the mind, the core emotion is that we move away from is fear. Okay. From the heart, it's the core emotion we move away from is shame or rejection. And from the guts, the core emotion that we move away from is anger. All right. So when you know which is the, the main emotion that triggers you, you kind of start to understand better which center you come from. Could you okay. be a mixture of two? Could someone yeah, we are a mixture of all of it, actually. But very often we have two preferred ones, which are our, our, um, the ones which drive us the most. Right? For example, in my case, I would say I come more from the heart and the mind. So there's an element of kind of shame and rejection and fear. Okay? Anger is something which is it's, it's pretty easy for me. I, I'm, very rarely angry, actually. Like calm, uh, calm, calm and so on. Yeah. But it, it depends on people. So coming back to the Enneagram in that sense, it's, uh, it helps you. It's a profiling tool to help you better understand yourself. The objective of it is self-exploration. So as to expand your self-awareness. And that's the journey towards self-mastery and high performance. It starts from there. So presumably each time, if you could, without delving into too much details, if you could just briefly go through the nine core types. And I guess each type has a, I guess, a positive connotation and a slightly more negative one. Would that be an accurate description? So, yeah, you can say each type has, 
as, as no one is perfect, right? So you have your plus points, plus you have the errors to watch out for. Mm -hmm. So uh, what could be derailers of that? So each type has that. You have the nine taps. One, the type one is considered to be more perfectionist by nature. Okay. Type two is someone who is driven to be a helper, a carer and, and supporter. So they, they are driven from the heart to help people. Type three is more achiever. They're driven to achieve, to complete things and driven to succeed. The type four is more what I would call the romantic or the, create, the creative person who likes to create things and needs to feel an element of uniqueness to what they are adding. Right. Type five is the observer, the researcher. So they are driven by this, the, the quest for knowledge. And for example, a lot of academics who do research are type five, okay? Six is the loyalist. They, they, they look for security and safety around them. And they are always making sure that things are structured enough for us to feel safe. Type seven is what you call the Epicurean. Another word for it, the way we describe it, someone who is who likes to seek new experiences, adventures, and needs a variety of things, and is always exploring different options. Type eight is basically the boss, right. the one who needs to be in charge, the commander. If, for example, in an army, a general, that's the the type eight, and the type nine, the, the the last one is someone who is the mediator, the pacifier, the one who maintains stability and harmony around. So that's okay. the nine core types. And when, in, in your years of experience, and I guess yourself, include, yourself included in, in that question, have you ever run the profiling based on what you knew or thought you knew about your, the, that person, including yourself? Have you ever been surprised by the result or where you, 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 in your mind, knowing what you know about profile types, you had cast them in, in, as a certain type and they actually turned out to be another type? Yes, definitely. A lot of times, actually, including for myself. The first time when I did it uh, around well, 15 years ago, <laughs> I always thought I was more a perfectionist based from what I've been told by other people until when I did it. So I thought I was one, yeah. but what came out was my, the, 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 the first type what came out for me was three. So more achiever focus and that. And that's where it's like I started to connect the dots better. So I started to understand why I was doing a certain things in a certain way. While I'm someone who's quite structured in my approach, but I'm more, more always focused on the outcome and it started to make sense. So having done it with a couple of people, also it helped me better realize at the core, what, what often happens is we see a person for a certain angle, for a certain facet, or for a certain lens, and then we generalize about it. Mm. But my main realization using tools like this is that you don't generalize, you suspend judgment, and you take the time to better understand the different facets of people. Right. And based on the outcome, how can you then, because it's obviously also, especially when it comes as a surprise, it may show you facets of yourself that you either didn't know or you weren't aware of. How can you then use that to improve yourself should you wish to do so? So then what you start with is, I think, two things. There's an element of curiosity. Mm -hmm. So you hold a curious frame, a curious mind that you want to explore more about it. A second one is about openness, to be open to, well, based on what came out, and also you can validate with others. So, so for example, when we did it with my wife, and I was surprised by the... Oh, really? Was she surprised. surprised? Was she surprised? She was surprised as well, but not as much as me. <laughs> oh, really? <laughs> <laughs> and then she said, but of course I'm like that. You didn't know? And I said, yeah. <laughs> now it so, makes sense. <laughs> it makes sense. Yeah. And, and okay. that really helped. So that open frame to be able to see, you know, we have a tendency to generalize because for human beings, we need to simplify things to, to understand. And if we have one or two pointers, that's enough for us to label people. I see. Yeah. Yeah. I agree. So yeah. it's really, it allows you to suspend that judgment, move out of the delay, delabeling, mm -hmm. and then understand that there is more complexity, there's more richness to human character. One of the things I struggle with when I remember you, you sent me the test to do, and I think it, 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 correct me if I'm wrong, it asked you questions and asked you to answer it based on the last 10 years. Yeah, I, I think so. One of the reasons I struggled with it is when I look at how I was 10 years ago compared with who I am now, 
because it, it specifically said, don't just use the snapshot of even six months ago up till now. You need to go back that length of time. But because I feel, perhaps I'm deluding myself, I don't know, but I feel I have so fundamentally changed from the, you know, the 30 year old who I was then that I, that's where I struggled with the test because I didn't know how to answer the question because, you know, when you look at, if I were to answer 10 years ago versus five years ago versus now, I would give three different answers. Okay. Yeah. Actually, it's really, when you look back, it's really about connecting the dots, back, looking right. backwards. Okay. Right. Of course, we are works in progress. We evolve with time. If I were to do the same exercise today compared to 10 years ago, some of my answers would be, would be a bit different. But at the end of the day, your core type, what you come from, won't change. Right. For example, are you more driven from the heart or from the guts, more intuitive or more from the mind, more into thinking? That necessarily won't change. OK, so what might change would be some of the traits in terms of to what extent you would be more open to confront people, to have difficult conversations or to what extent you'd be more patient. So as we know, with time, we become a bit more patient, we become more accepting yeah. compared to 10 years ago. So you kind of you it changes with time but your core type doesn't change. So when you're doing such an exercise, if you tell you to look at yourself over the last 10 years, so it's really connecting with, again, that's one frame. The frame I, I, I advise people to do is don't overthink, just answer what you feel on the gut, your gut feel of the moment and answer that. Okay. Because the that's the true that part where yeah. what your, your body knows, your body won't lie to you. Your inner knowing doesn't lie to you on that. So just answer what you feel on the moment and that's it. And that's what you'll get. And yeah. when you redo the exercise again in a couple of years, do the same process, you'll see okay. how you'll have shifted then. And I think what's also very important, and I, I kind of made a conscious effort to do that, is that ultimately you can't cheat yourself. You have to be really honest because, you know, you might click an answer because that's who you would like to be as opposed to who you are. So, for example... You, you mentioned some of some things are driven by fear, for example, or anger. You might like to not care about what other people think, but in reality, that might be different. So when you're answering those questions, you actually, you have to be honest with yeah, yourself. Yeah, because at the end of the day, you're doing it for yourself. You're not doing it for a job or trying to do impression management. Yeah. The key here is to be honest to yourself, as you mentioned, so that you have a result which fits with basically who you are. Yeah, yeah. Another aspect we, we spoke about as well. So this is one, I guess, profiling type, but I'm sure there are others. Are they all the same? And, and if they're not all the same, could it cause confusion if you do different profiling? Could it just do more harm than good? Yeah, actually, it could do more harm than good if you do too many at the same time. And it creates confusion. Sure. The way I would explain it with a metaphor is like, if you do and go and do a scan of your head, if you do a scan of your head, right? So if you take by scan, I mean, for example, an X-ray, sure. you won't get a three-dimensional picture with an X-ray. You'll get one snapshot from one angle. Yeah. So the same metaphor applies for personality profiles. You get a snapshot from one perspective, one lens that they're looking at it. So the Enneagram is a typewriter from a, a specific angle that they look at. If you take Hogan, which is another tool that is often used or facet 5 or MBTI, they will look at it from their own angle based on the research they've done. Right. So what, what you can do over time, over a certain time, once you've mastered one, you've understood it, you do another one to, to enrich your map, to get a different perspective, and it adds to it. So that's what you could do. Secondly, what you have to watch out for is you get a lot of information, then you don't know what to do with it. Okay, yes, because yes. it's an overwhelm yes. of da yes. data and insights. So, okay, all this, what do I do? Where do I start? So that's where I take it one step at a time, focus on it, better understand, let it integrate, let it sink in. And then from there, come up with, okay, so what can I leverage on in terms of my strengths? What am I good at? What could be areas that I might want to tweak a bit to, to be more at par on? Don't overthink and don't try to stretch yourself. Some tools might be also very have a lot of jargons in it, very technical in nature, so it becomes more difficult to interpret. Then you need assistance from a trained coach or someone certified in the tool to accompany you in it. So 
when you choose a tool, the things that I look at is how simple is it to use and to understand. Second, if the research behind it and whether you can get support from someone who's training it to accompany you in the journey for self-discovery and development. Yeah, yeah. And, and also, I think that there are sometimes that there's another something else that I did recently. And the, the theme that came out, I don't want to go into too much detail about it, but the thing that came out was structure. And I found that so confusing because I always saw myself as someone who thrived in chaos, <laughs> if I may put it like that. But when, but I think you're quite right that when you take the time to go through it again and understand exactly what it means and what they're trying to say, I told myself that actually there can be structure within chaos and, you know, you can up your game as it were if you if you find the right structure within i mean it doesn't mean you have to you know suddenly become an ultra okay, uh, yeah. organized person but but it did require I, I listened to that recording at least three times to try to i guess come to terms with it because you know as you we were talking about earlier sometimes you might not be happy with the with the result because you think that you think you are a particular type and I guess it requires flexibility of mind and you to be open-minded, open to, to change and open to saying, because this is grounded in research or whatever, maybe there is something to it. <laughs> are there any favorites or do you think that each one have, have their own use in, in or do you have a favorite? I don't have a favorite. I, each one has their own purpose. For example, in a work context, at the moment, we use Facet 5. There is for leadership development, we are starting to use Hogan. For personal development coaching, I particularly like the Enneagram. So these are, I would say, the three that I use the most. The most yeah. And there are, there are fun ones that you can use. For example, there's an interesting one about your animal spirit. Ah, I love that. Okay. okay. <laughs> and it's a, a shared question. Can you do that online? Can you yeah, find you can do it online. Okay, yeah. So, and I did it with my link. kids also. <laughs> okay. My and were you surprised there as well? Or did it make sense when it, it came It made out? sense. The interesting one about that one was my elder son came out as a gazelle. Oh, wow. Yeah, and okay. the little one came out as a tiger. <laughs> so, <laughs> and that kind of made sense with their made personality sense, types? The way they, re okay. they interact with each other. I love so, that. <laughs> I love that. And what were you? For me, I think I was a fox or something like that. Okay, yeah, a fox. okay, okay. I must try that. <laughs> yeah, no, I, I'm, I'm fascinated with that. And I, I wanted to link that to our next topic, which is the kind of the future of work. And I mean, it doesn't mean you need to do a profile time in order to kind of necessarily be better at work. But I think you would agree with me that the work place and you know work in general the very definition of work is changing i think i don't know whether you agree with him but elon musk said recently that you know he predicted that some of us may not even have to work i don't know whether you agree with him but he he kind of because of ai etc what is your assessment of your what you think the future of work will look like <laughs> <laughs> Uh, that's a crystal ball. <laughs> yeah, I know, I know. <laughs> um, and it's still work, it's work in progress. It's, it's still changing and it's evolving so fast. I think the way I'd look at it is from three angles. Mm -hmm. One is the nature of work is changing. Uh, the workplace is changing and the workforce. That is the, the skills which define the workforce of today and tomorrow. So the, the nature of work, the way it's changing is, so if you look at it, as we are, we are, the world of work is impacted by two main drivers okay. of change. Okay. Green transition, transition to sustainability and green energy and low carbon future. Mm -hmm. And second is technology. Okay. Yeah. Okay. So technology, which is disrupting the way we do things with more and more AI, machine learning, big data, and so on. Mm -hmm. And at the same time, in providing new opportunities. So, so that's, these are two main drivers of change on the nature of work. Second, the workforce then is the skills which are required. So they are, World Economic Forum generated a report last year mm -hmm. about the future of work. So you can research on that, World Economic Forum Future of Work Report 2023. And they share the top 10 jobs on the rise mm -hmm. and the top 10 jobs on the decline. Currently. Currently. And with an um, outlook for the next three to five years. 
Okay, and they can't predict beyond that. Of course. And the top, among the top 10 jobs on the rise, around seven out of the 10 didn't exist three years ago. Three, only three years yeah. ago. Can right. you give us an example? So, for example, uh, machine uh, learning. So five years ago, you didn't have a lot of people going working on big data, machine learning, AI. So those examples, sustainability specialists with a specific focus on green energy or energy transition and so on, you didn't have that much available. So even university didn't have the courses to be able to train people. As it emerged, now they're having to start to design programs to be able to run it. And even that, universities are, are having to play catch up. And on the other side, the jobs which are on the decline, it's a very simple one, is every job which is of a formulaic nature, okay. which is, yeah. has a formula, yeah. is being replaced by a machine. It's being replaced by an AI or a bot, which is taking over. So that part of essential work or non-essential work is being replaced. And what, is, what the kind of jobs which are emerging are what we call advantage work and advantage support. Okay. So work which creates an advantage mm -hmm. or which provides a support to create an advantage. So if we look at an area which I believe, and I'm not in this area, so this is maybe just my kind of bias, requires a lot of uh, human touch, which is your job <laughs> or your field of work. Where do you find AI and machine learning in, in that sphere? Do they have a role to play? They have a role to play, as I mentioned. For, if you look at it, work can be divided into four categories. Mm -hmm. Okay, so you have advantage work, so you work that creates an advantage for an organization. Advantage support, so that's the second one. Any support which helps to create advantage. Yeah. You have essential work, which is back office mm -hmm. process, and non-essential work. Mm -hmm. So AI, automation, and so on are going to take over your essential work and non-essential work. Right. So non-essential, you can also outsource it in a mode of a, a model of a hybrid workforce, which you can work with freelancers, you can out outsource, sure. that would be non-essential, okay? So that would help organizations then, or for example, in the human resources field, spend more time on other dimensions with related to creating employee experience, helping develop people, compared to doing a lot of process and bureaucracy. So things like, for example, recruitment could to some extent be automated? Yeah. Yeah. So you can use, for example, I'll give an example. Yeah, sure. In Rogers, at the moment, we are using AI. We've started using AI for the past two years to do our first level recruitment, so first selection. So we use a tool, an um, interviewer AI, to do the first round of interviews. So you, the, the person gets to be interviewed by, to do a video interview with an AI asking the questions, and then it generates a report for us. So the AI produces a report based on the questions, how it's been answered. Wow. So we get to prepare the questions and then the person gets one minute per, per question to answer and afterwards generates a report. Of course, if there, there's an issue, we can also redo the interview as well for the person. So if they have had a, a technical glitch or and so on. So there's an element of flexibility in that also. But for all intents and purposes, it is a live interview. So it's not like they get the questions in advance no, that they live. can sit no. down and prepare no, no. or whatever. Yeah. Okay. How has your experience been on that? Do you think it's, it's, it's added value to, it's, to your life? Yeah, it's definitely added a lot of value for us in the sense that it has allowed us to gain time. You see, the first round interviews, when you do it, it takes a lot of time to schedule mm -hmm. uh, interviews, yeah, to sure, call candidates, sure. to bring them in, and it yeah. takes your time to do the first round interviews. It's allowed us to, to increase our hiring success in the sense that we've been able to then properly profile and uh, select the best candidates for the next round. And it's also helped us to sort out, sort through those who are the most serious about the positions. Right. So you see, you have a lot of no-shows or rescheduling, which happens. And or they're or trying five different people different, at the same time. Yeah, and they, yeah. Yeah, they're just yeah. trying around. So yeah. when we ask them to do it, then they say, okay, maybe, you know, I'm, I don't want to go for it. So then sure. it really helps you select those who are the most interested and motivated by the position. So it allowed us to be more productive and freed up time for us mm. in that sense. For, for more advantage. For more advantage work. work. Yeah. So one example of an advantage work which this allowed us to do is when you look at the workplace, the workplace now is being redefined into four elements. 
Okay, so what we normally call the workplace is mainly a physical workplace. But now there are three more elements that you add to the physical workplace. The emotional workplace, so how do you create engagement, experience for the people that you work with? How do you create that sense of community and belongingness? You have the technological workplace, so how do you enable them with the, tech, with the right tech, as well as remote working and tools to be able to do hybrid work? And finally, the purposeful workplace. So how do you create a sense of purpose, a sense of meaning and balance in terms of why you do what you do? And that's where you have factors like diversity and inclusion, sustainability, meaningful purpose and change. Why am I doing things? And it, this, is, this is very much attuned to younger generations. You see mm. Gen Z asking you those questions. Why, sure. Uh, what, what will give me purpose in what I do? Do you think they're all equally weighted? Important. A good question. I'm not sure it's equally weighted today. You have to look at it from the four angles. Mm -hmm. But I believe what is emerging more strongly is the emotional workplace is taking a big part. That's where it becomes an advantage work. When you have a strong emotional and purposeful workplace, you can bring it together if you want. That makes you a best employer. Mm, okay. And do you think, I mean, one of the things that really struck me from what you said earlier is that the report mentioned that some of the jobs didn't exist only three years ago, which is nothing, it's, you know, COVID years. If we go back to education, not tertiary, primary and secondary, do you think then, bearing that in mind, that a lot of the things that our children are learning now, I wouldn't say are redundant, but should we also be re-looking at education? Definitely, not just primary, but at all levels, actually. If you look at it, university, some university courses, by the time you start the first year, by the end, by the time you end, you, you graduate third year or fourth year, some of your topics are already obsolete. Exactly. Right. Yeah. So yeah. that ability, I think what needs to be changed at the education level is to teach meta skills. So how do you learn? What you call developing learning agility is one. How do you manage your stress? How do you manage your work-life balance? How do you manage your time, your energy? These are things which are not taught. How do you manage relationships and build relationships with people? These are will be critical skills which will help you thrive in whatever environment. As well as how do you manage change? How do you adapt to change and how things are evolving? I think some of the skills that we need to teach our kids today is one is coding. Right. Which I don't think is taught no. at the, un unless you do kind of extracurricular yeah. activities. Yeah. With that. It's I not a core it's all... subject. Mm. Mm. It should be because yeah. the, way, the way the future is going, it's very te technology course. based. Yeah. And if you don't understand technology, you're not taught in the proper manner with the right foundation, you are at a disadvantage. So, so that's definitely one. I think some of the other subjects is about the whole element of green transition and sustainability. If we want to change the mindsets of people towards the planet and with climate change and so on, we need to start at a younger age, early age, with the right mindset for mm. that. And, and even some things like, I mean, I don't know, I, I still think, I think it's because I belong to that old generation where things like attention to detail mattered a lot. But because everything is kind of semi-automated now, you've got your spell checkers, etc. I find that, for example, I don't know whether you, you'd agree with me, generally, I find that people tend to, children tend to read less now than they, they did before. I remember spending most of my childhood reading, probably because there were three channels. So do, things like that, do you think, because my thinking is, yes, there, are, there is AI, there is machine learning, etc., but these skills develop parts of your brain that will then enable you to develop other skills. Spatial awareness, attention to detail generally, as opposed to just uh, in the books. So do you think there are certain core things that should still remain, even though in that particular aspect, a machine could do it for you later? I think, yeah, definitely there will be elements that need to remain. So your core basic elements about science, about mathematics, about languages, I think that, that, that remains core to us as a human being to better understand. Uh, the whole notion of, I think, the element of having faith, spirituality is also an important element uh, and understanding different cultures. What needs to evolve on that side, on the other side, is 
my perspective is that the education system is still based on the industrial era. True. Yes. And it yeah. hasn't shifted to an information era. Mm-hmm. If we take the example of our kids, uh, my kids at the moment, well, they are 11 and 8. Mm-hmm. And it's, you can imagine how frustrated I am when they, uh, they are they're on holidays and they have books at home. I have a full collection of Tintin, yeah. uh, Lucky Liu, and they're so on, interested. and they're not interested. <laughs> <laughs> they're not interested. Yeah. And they're more interested with learning through YouTube yes. and so on. Yes. So I was surprised when I was telling them they wanted to find out about something specifically and they were asking me. And I said, well, it's in, it's in that book. And I said, they said, no, already we've already found it on YouTube and I've, I've seen the video. And, wow. and it, it clicked for me that, like, yeah, true. It's, uh, the, the medium has changed. We don't need to go and read now. You have it accessible. Someone has already done a video about it, a how-to. And in that sense, they're, they're smarter than the way I yes, am thinking. Yeah, because you know? they, yeah. I guess it has its pros and cons because on the one hand, it, they showed initiative and, and proactivity. On the other hand, and maybe that's my bias, I don't know whether I'm correct in saying that, I remember better when I read something, particularly if I read it in hard copy and even more if I write it. Whereas if I watch something, I'm not sure I would necessarily remember it as, as well. I, I think it depends on our learning styles. I but see. with gen- yeah. younger generations, their learning yeah. style is shifting compared True. to ours. True. The example I have, a concrete one, my, my elder son, he likes to eat. <laughs> oh, <laughs> Every day his main question is, okay. what's on the menu? <laughs> does, he, does he participate in the creation he, he, of the... He participates <laughs> and he came up, he was telling his my wife, his mom, I want to make, uh, can you make a specific pasta recipe? Okay. okay. And my wife says, well, go and look for it. There's a recipe okay. book there. Okay. And he went to YouTube, he looked for a recipe. He learned how to do it. And then, then he wrote it down. I see. So he didn't okay. go and read. Look. Yes. He yes. went to look at how someone is doing it, a wow. proof of concept, and then write it down with his own way of doing it. And he brought it back to us. That's amazing. And did she cook it? Yes. <laughs> 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 amazing, amazing. They never cease to amaze me. And I always, I always think that, you know, when some of the stuff they come up with these days, that I, I don't remember being like that yeah. when, when I was there. So, their age, and, yeah. and my main learning from that is we have to trust their resourcefulness. Mm. Yeah, absolutely. 100%. And, you know, who knows what things will look like in when they reach working age, you know, in 10, 15 years time. But are you... Are you hopeful for the future? Because sometimes, you know, you, you can become quite, you can have a quite dystopian view. Sometimes, you know, when I look at AI and chat GPT and how do you call that, deep fakes, and, you know, you see the potential dangers as well. But just kind of from a general perspective, when you look at, think of future of the workplace, are you, are you more hopeful than not? <laughs> I am naturally an Posit- optimist positive, yeah. and uh, more hopeful than, than not, actually. And I fundamentally believe in the resourcefulness of people and ability of being agile. So if you look at it, human as human beings, we have agility encoded in our DNA. Sure. We are hardwired to survive. Yeah, to adapt. And to and, adapt mm-hmm. and to keep moving with, with time. So in general, people will be able to move forward. Suffice, you have one or two people who start to lead the way and then you have others who start to adapt and adopt it. So in general, I'm positive and hopeful. (laughs) Last question, and I'll just throw it out there because I I, am fascinated by the subject, but I didn't want to kind of it to be the focus of today is, do you think as we, you know, there's more emphasis on technology, more emphasis on machine learning, AI and all of that, are we losing touch with our spirituality are we losing touch with who we are a spiritual person i'm not talking about religion and do you think that it's important to to remain in touch with it because of that the more so because of, of that i think it's connected in a way that the more people have access to technology they more have, they have access to information and when you have access to information you opens your mind so what i've found what i've seen so far is the more people have access to certain technologies and they start to look for meaning and purpose, it connects them back to their spirituality. So it's when you're disconnected from it that Mm. you have Mm. la tête dans le guidon, Mm. comme on dit, and you don't have time for yourself and you're constantly trying to survive, then you're disconnected from it. So 
again, coming back to being a hopeful, being yes. a, an optimist, uh, I believe, and we see it more and more with younger generations looking for purpose, looking for meaning. So that, that's one fundamental element, essence of spirituality is to live with purpose and to create positive impact around you. And you have more and more younger generation coming up with those, with that kind of drive. And do you see that in the workplace as well, like at Rogers, for example, do you see these sort of curiosity and, and open-mindedness, I guess, the type of questions that are coming from the young? So the young. actually, yes. What I've found is you have people who have, an, have a spiritual practice at the same time. And by that, I, I'm not saying religion and so on. They, they have a service to, to community. They find ways to support communities around them. Some are into yoga teaching, yoga training. Some are into meditation as well. And some take time to go and fly around the world to do retreats or being a nomad and so on. So you have more and more of that coming up because as they, they are connected to social media, they see other people doing it, it has an impact as well. It has a domino effect as well. So I am of those who believe that there is a wave, there's an awakening, and more and more people are being more attuned to that and are connecting to their spirituality. And I think that that's deeply connected with the workplace as well, because we're then moving away from a company being there to achieve value for their shareholders. And, and whilst you can still achieve that, you, you need to provide purpose. I think that's so fundamental. So it's moving from shareholder value to shared value. Shared value, I like that. <laughs> Thank you so much. Last, last question. You, you've been busy writing your book. I want to know when it's out. <laughs> and in a nutshell, what, what is what it's about? Okay, so it's the third book of the Shots of Insights and Disruptor. It's called Architects of Opportunity. Okay. And it's about how do you envision, how do you act as an architect of opportunity who envisions, mm -hmm. who executes, who em empathizes and enhances for positive impact around him or her. Okay, so and it's for anyone. It's for anyone. It's it's really it's a, it's a it's a way of looking at leadership from a lens of how do you see and vision a, a better future, and what are the steps you create to be able to realize that while creating positive impact around you. It's not necessarily someone who is particularly ambitious professionally. It could be of use to someone who who just wants to develop from on a personal level as well. Yeah. Definitely, and it's going to be out in the next three months. Amazing. The next three Thank months. you so much, Manish. Thank you. Thank you, <laughs> Thank Joanne. You. It's been a pleasure.